Get really excited for what you're about to experience today. We have a new friend here. I actually met our speaker today, uh, Shagun Otolana today. I met, I met him today right before chapel. I've heard lots about him from people that I deeply respect, like Pastor Chris and Kim Polk, who sits on our board, and Dwayne Donner and others. Uh, but I actually just met him today. It was really fun. I met him and his wife, Mary, who's also here today. And then Nora and Kate are also with us in chapel today. And so I love it. They, hey, they skipped school to be at HC, and I'm believing, Nora, for sure, you're coming to Highlands College in Jesus' name. She's saved. She's shaking her head. And so y'all be sure y'all say hey to the, 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 the family. They actually have, their, they have four children, but two of them are here today. And so excited to have their family here today. Also find out we're neighbors, which is a whole lot of fun. And can't wait to see them just in the neighborhood. And also, uh, Shagan, I don't know if you know this, but I graduated from UAB. So Blazer for life. We got that connection, uh, which is a whole lot of fun. And really excited for you to hear him today. He was actually going to be uh, at chapel back in January, on January 16th. But we had that snow day that it didn't snow. Y'all remember that? And so we're really excited that we're able to reschedule him uh, today. And so he's coming from a different perspective, of course, loves Jesus, but God's called him into the business space. And God has blessed him in an incredible way. You're going to hear more of of their story uh, today. I'll let him share that. But it's really cool to see how God can use us all in different ways. And the anointing and the ministry in his heart coming out in the business space is making a huge difference. He's the founding and managing partner of Harmony Ventures. And I'm sure you'll hear more about the the miracle of of that story and what God has done. He's also the CEO of Copysmith AI, which is a new startup that's using AI uh, to create content, which is really cool. He's a part of a lot of different organizations. They attend the Grants Mill campus, so they're Highlands family. Come on, stand to your feet and welcome our speaker today, Shagun Otolana. I didn't trip. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what it, good morning, everybody. <laughs> it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Pastor Mark, for the uh, introduction. I brought my cheerleaders. Uh, But, but it, it's also the first time they've heard me speak to a group of people, so I hope they behave themselves. <laughs> they actually make me a little nervous. Um, but it's good to be here. So what, what I want to do today is actually tell the story of my journey and then um, tie that into life and how we do big things in life. That, that's, that's the big thing I, I really want to get across to you. So over the next 30 minutes or so, We're going to walk through the journey, we're going to take out some lessons, and then we're going to have a Q&A session. So don't be shy, just let me have it. I'll try my best to give you a good answer. You you need to listen, this is the LA accent. Uh, That's Lagos, Alabama. So, (laughs) so, um, So first I'll kind of walk you through the journey. I grew up in Nigeria, I was born in Lagos. I left at the age of 18 to move to the United States to go to college. Uh, I picked UAB because I had an older brother that was already at UAB and my parents said, you're going to where you are family, so I said, sure. Um, so, why did I leave? Well, if you, if you pass, or if you rewind to the mid 90s, Nigeria was going through a lot of turmoil. They still are in a different way, but back then it was a dictatorship, and I'm a child of two people that didn't get the kind of opportunity you guys have, Uh, but they were fortunate, they were believers, and they worked very hard, and the thing they wanted to leave their children was the fear of God, a love of learning, and a great education, and... um, when things were getting in the way of that, they decided, well, we're going to go to where things will not get in the way of that. So the kids started leaving. My mother has 10 of us. Um, and we all eventually left. So came to the U.S., went to UAB, graduated, met my wonderful wife in college. Uh, I think part of this is just how I was brought up. I've always been entrepreneurial. That's what I know. That's what I've been looking forward to my whole life is to build things. But I had a job, and every day I would come home and complain about my job. I'm like, I really love people I work with, but I'm not happy anymore. And uh, at some point, she said, look, we all know what you really want to do, so go do it, and I'll be here. Uh, I'm not going anywhere you can fail, and I'm sure you'll get a job if you fail, but 
I'm all the way behind you. And that was what actually pushed me to take the step to go to my uh, superiors and tell them I was leaving. And that was 2011. So in 2000, that was 2010. In 2011, I went all in on being an entrepreneur full time. Uh, I'm not saying that's the formula. You always have to remember to take advice in context. Um, I'll actually advise a little differently, but I had God's favor on my life. So here is what happened. When I went to my bosses and told them I was leaving, they actually said, you know what? We've all been waiting for when you will come tell us you're leaving. <laughs> uh, but we will actually continue to pay you through the balance of the year uh, while you figure yourself out because we don't think you actually know your game plan yet. <laughs> uh, so that began the entrepreneurial journey in January, but the deal I had with Mary was I've tried this thing before. I actually had tried my hands at trying to build things and had failed. Uh, had a partner, things didn't work out, so it, it wasn't necessarily new to do the entrepreneurial thing. I'm that child that takes the video game and charges their friends $10 to play, you know, things like that. So, <laughs> so it's kind of always been there. Um, but within our context as a family, we were just starting our family, we didn't have much. Uh, so taking the leap to go start something, me without a job, surviving on just my wife's salary was not easy, but we took the leap and I had certain criteria that I had set as what would be a great idea. My goal was to continue to experiment with different ideas and to see what I get inspired about to go build with certain things in mind. Number one, I wanted it to be a group of people I could see myself serving for the next decade of my life. So no matter how excited I was about an idea, I looked at the people and I was like, Is this, are these people I would want to keep serving for the next 10 years of my life? Um, I needed it to be web-based back then. Uh, the web, or what we call software as a service, was beginning to get traction. I wanted it to be a SaaS software. I wanted it to be something I could build with a team because part of what I had realized about myself was that I thrive in the team setting versus there are many things you can do in life by yourself, and you can be successful as a solo person, but that was not me by nature. Number one, I procrastinate. So <laughs> I can be very lazy on things I really don't enjoy doing. So I, I needed a team to kind of pass that to. Um, and so I had this criteria I'd set, and that actually led to serving the mental health space. A friend asked me to come help a company it was part of that was in the mental health space to build software. So my background was software engineering, software development. I did not want to take the meeting because if you think about this, this was 2012 and it just didn't make sense to me that somebody wanted me to come build a software for their clinic because I was like, just go buy one. There are lots of software there for you to buy. Um, but that was God actually leading my path. So. I took the meeting anyway because this was a friend. And I went there and I connected to them. And this was actually a, a, um, a religious mental health clinic. So it was church affiliated. And I was blown away by the number of people they were serving and the kind of impact they were having. I, I didn't know much about mental health, to be honest with you. But it checked the first box. Do I want to serve these people for the next 10 years of my life? But I wasn't sure they had a real problem yet, right? Because the, the key to building businesses is to find a unique problem that somebody has that you can solve in a differentiated way. That's the, that's the secret. Um, so I told them, I, I don't think you need somebody to build this for you. So let me go do the research, and I'll come back to you with some options for you to just buy and use. But my research led me to other things around the space, and it became clear that this fit other things I was looking for in terms of what I wanted to build, and that this industry and their need was at an inflection point that I could take advantage of. So that led to a company called Theranest. Uh, they became my partners in that journey, like my first customer, my design partners. 
I built something small for them, and then I told them, I'm going to build my own thing, and then you're going to pay to use my thing. But in the meantime, this is a tool you can keep using, and I'll build this company called Theranos. I am terrible at naming companies. The first company before Theranos was called Xertis. It's terrible. Uh, <laughs> nobody could say it, but Mary actually came up with the name Theranos. You can see the thing here. She, she's kind of a recurring theme there. Um, so, and that began the journey of Theranos, and they became my first customer. I went to the second counseling center called Impact. Some of you may know Impact Family Counseling. Uh, and I was talking to the executive director about what I was building, and he said, hey, let my people look at it. So they did, and they came back and they said, it's missing this, this, and this. I was like, okay, fine. I can build all that, but it's going to cost you this much, and it's still going to belong to me. You're just paying for me to accelerate the building of that. And he looks at me, and he's like, well, if anything is more than $1,000, I have to go to my board to get approval. And I looked at him, and I said, George, it's $1,000. Okay. So, so <laughs> forget whatever I told you before. Just pay me $1,000, and I'll build it for you. So, so, so uh, they became the, the, the second customer, and the journey began. But the challenge was we had run out of funds. We had used credit cards everything we had to kind of get to where we are. This was now 2013. This journey started in 2011, so you can see. So it was a year and a half of finding what I wanted to build while I took on side projects and other consulting work, and I was a terrible consultant. Uh, Mary's a CPA, and she always told me, you are the worst consultant in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is because somebody pays me to move this water from here to here, and it's $20. Okay, and then I take the $20, I move the water from here to here, and then the person looks at me and says, actually, I need it to move 20 times, but I don't charge any extra. They just pay me the $20, and I move it 20 times, and Mary's like, that's not how it works. I'm like, oh, you know. So, which was actually part of why I did not want to be a consultant. I just wanted to build a product that I could just sell without... That was one of the criteria also, no sales team. I did not want to have a sales team to be successful. There are certain ideas in the world that you can't sell without building a large sales team. I, I, I knew if I had to do that, there may be a problem. So it was also one of the five criteria I had set for myself. Um, I wanted to be able to just market this and build it, and people come to me and buy it. Of course, what you end up finding out when you try to build a company is you will always have to sell. There is just no way around it. Um, by the way, that also became a challenge because when I went to seek investors for the company, there were two things I kept running into. One was, you've never been in healthcare, um, so you're some guy with some funny name and a funny accent from God knows where. You've never been in healthcare, and you want us to give you money to go build this thing. So many people just said no, right? Uh, the second thing was I wanted to sell software in healthcare without a sales team, which many people in Birmingham just also didn't understand because Birmingham is a healthcare city, but the kind of healthcare we sell in Birmingham is to like hospitals and large clinics. This software was to mental health clinics. We actually bought in a very different way, but my investors kind of struggled to understand that. The inflection point for that industry was, if you, many of you may not know this, but back then, a lot of software you actually bought it, and then it was yours. And there was a trend called software as a service, which today everybody uses, where you buy software, but you use it online, and you keep paying for it. And that, that was when that was really beginning to take off. So if you thought about the people I was about to serve, they were transitioning in their own small businesses from buying software on a CD, like QuickBooks, that they used to run their business, to buying QuickBooks Online, for example, where they just subscribe and they just use QuickBooks Online. And they wanted that same transition in the software that manages their practice. I could see that trend, but my investors really couldn't see the trend, so that created challenges. Uh, so we, we really struggled to fund the company, and somehow uh, someone I had worked with in the past as a consultant heard about this idea, asked me to come to his office, and he gave me the first check for the business. And when he gave me the check, 
he told me, it wasn't, it's a large sum, but not really a large sum. But he told me, he said, this will probably go to zero. <laughs> uh, but you're a smart guy, so the next thing you do, I'm also going to be in it. And I'm looking at him like, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> Number one, if you tell me that, your check's not going to go to zero. I don't care if I have to deliver a, a thousand pizzas to pay you back. Like, so, so that was uh, very inspiring, and it really gave me momentum. At the end of the day, we're able to find a few people that really were part of that journey. But there are some lessons that came out of that journey, and then I'll wrap up the journey real quick. This is how it ended up happening. Over the next eight and a half years, we built a business that became very, very successful, and I sold that business in 2021 for the largest exit for a SaaS software business in the state of Alabama and one of the largest in the Southeast, uh, north of a billion dollars, which was quite incredible for a company with very little funding. Uh, we grew from zero to a company of about six to 700 people, uh, highly successful, very impactful by the time I exited the business in 2021. Uh, so I believe it is still the largest SaaS software exit in the state. Um, but at a, in a very short period of time, we're able to achieve so much success. And the principles that kind of guided the business, that guided our work in life, are principles that apply to pretty much everything we do in life. And I kind of want to walk you through those principles when you want to do big things, especially when you want to do big things in a concentrated period of time. So if you look at this journey, this is in two decades, God's favor took me from nothing to building a billion dollar business within two decades of coming into this country. Uh, but there are certain things that happen and you have to look out for, and when you know those things, whether, wherever you, your zone of influence is, you can really take advantage of those things because God has actually given us a lot of the wisdom we need to really do these things, and we just have to look for them. So the first thing I would say is for you to do big things, you have to increase or expand your zone of opportunity. Uh, some call this, so what, what do I mean by zone of opportunity? Some call this luck. Uh, some call it serendipity. My point is chance does play a role. Chance plays a role in our journey. But that's where God's favor comes in. I call it God's favor. Uh, there are many things that happen that you can't really control. You can't, uh, like, like Steve Jobs says, you connect the dots backwards. You get to where you're going, and then you look backwards, and you see how the dots connect. And God is working for you. So the thing you have to remember is the mission is greater than you, but the journey actually starts with you. So, but the number one job that you have to do is to do things that expand your zone of opportunity. And what does it mean to expand your zone of opportunity? If you think about it, the first zone of opportunity for me was to leave where I was and go to the right place. My story would not happen pretty much anywhere else if I did not come here to the U.S. So, being in the right place is a big part of expanding your zone of opportunity. The wonderful thing for many of you in this room is you're in a zone of opportunity already. And many people don't get that chance in life. So part of expanding your zone of opportunity is putting yourself in the right place and then being a fertile, a fertile ground for good seeds, right? Uh, so if you look at the Bible, you've all heard the parable of... Uh, uh, the sower, right? Some seeds fell in different places. Uh, and the Bible is, uh, and I'll touch on this multiple times as I talk about this. If you read Luke, in Luke it tells you the word is the seed, right? In Matthew it tells you the people of the kingdom are the seeds. So in a sense, it is how the word impacts you that determines how much of a fertile ground you, ha you are, right? And throughout the Bible, there is this continual emphasis on the importance of wisdom, and wisdom is really knowledge applied in the right context, okay? So for you to accelerate 
impact, it means you have to make the right decisions. And for you to make the right decisions, and you have to make them quickly in succession. For you to make the right decisions, it means you have to have the right operating system in your head and in your mind guided by the Spirit of God, and that comes from having the right knowledge. So sometimes the time it takes you to get from where you are to where you want to go is really determined by how long is it going to take you to learn what you need to learn. And if you can shorten that time, you can accelerate the journey. Shortening the time is part of looking for the zone of opportunity. You will notice even in the secular world, there is a trend around zones. So if you're in my world, in the world of technology, you are more highly likely to succeed if you're in Silicon Valley. It's become its own zone of opportunity around that, in a sense, right? And everybody tries to replicate it, but it's very hard because it has built up this knowledge and this skill set that it continues to take advantage of. If you're in biotech, you're more likely to succeed if you go to Boston. And you continue to see things like that. Over, if you're in, I don't know, I guess if you're in secular movies, you're probably more likely to succeed in New York or, or Hollywood or something like that. But you can see the trend. So that's one of the things you have to think about when you're looking for where to find yourself. Now, in my case, I was in Birmingham, and I had a lot of people that said, hey, you really can't do great big software companies in Birmingham, Alabama, because you won't have access to the talent and you won't have access to the capital, which was true, but here is the trick. You can still think globally no matter where you are, and the world is shrinking, and you can take advantage of that, which was what we did. Uh, but you have to remember the importance of wisdom and knowledge. It helps you make decisions faster, and you have the Spirit of God really interpreting the word to you, which is the, the seat of wisdom. If you remember Jesus' parable, it said, who is a wise man? The person who hears and does the things that I'm saying. And that's really the foundation for accelerated success. So in expanding your zone of opportunity, you really have to understand two things. They are very similar. You have to understand inflection points and tipping points, okay? So I, I won't get into math, but if you've seen graphs and you see where the concavity of a line changes, that's an inflection point. It's either turning up or turning down, right? And you have to listen to the Spirit of God and you have to look at the kind of information you need to have to know when things are at inflection points. In the world of technology, we're at a big inflection point with artificial intelligence, for example, right? So we decided to start an artificial intelligence related company in 2021. So you have to think about inflection points in your own journey in life. But you have to think about inflection points in relationships. You have to think about inflection points in the things you choose to do with your life. But you also have to think about tipping points. So tipping points are when things become uh, when a trend becomes highly acceptable, right? Uh, and how that translates in your life is going to be different for the different context you find yourself. But the point I'm trying to tell you is this to the eye, eyes that look are many, many eyes look, very few eyes see. So your eyes have to be seeing eyes if you're going to accelerate getting to the final destination. You have to be somebody who looks at things, looking for inflection points and looking for tipping points. Even in your relationship with other people, you have to think, is this person at an inflection point in their life that I can now double down on and help them get to where God is trying to get them to? Am I at an inflection point in my life where I have to make certain decisions about which direction my life is going to go? Now, as you do this, you have to pray because God needs to protect you. Not every door needs to be an open door. Some doors are traps in disguise. So you do need the wisdom of God, and you need uh, to, be, to be surrounded by people that you trust to give you the proper guidance in your journey um, so that you don't fall into a trap. 
But at the same time, this is how you have to think to be successful, understand inflection and tipping points. So one way to really see a lot of inflection and tipping points is one, you can't be afraid of failure, okay? You cannot be afraid of failure because inflection and tipping points typically come from doing things over and over and trial and error. You have to be comfortable with trial and error, but you have to be guided by the right mental frameworks. You have to think about how the Bible works. The Bible gives us the Ten Commandments, and then Jesus gives us the Beatitudes. You can see a lot of things work in rules and frameworks. So for you to be able to really take advantage of the opportunity God puts in front of you, you have to really get yourself in the right mental framework. Okay? You have to say yes to hard work. And you have to say yes to inconveniences because that's typically how opportunity shows up for you, okay? Uh, but something very important I have to tell this group is, th is that you all are actually inflection point creators and tipping point accelerators. That is what makes this room special you have been put in a position where you can create inflection point in people's lives and you can push people over the tipping point that they need to get to so that God can do wonderful things in their lives. I play that role in my world as a business person. You play that role in your world as people in the ministry and wherever you found yourself. And you have to be very conscious of this, that I am an inflection point creator and a tipping point accelerator. So I'm going to talk about the power law and the bell curve. We've, we all grew up with bell curves in our lives. Bell curve is this. The teacher grades on a curve. That's a bell curve. Things like that. Every day in life we're taught about bell curves. But here's the thing. God has actually designed human relationships and interactions to be more power law than bell curve. Even though human beings typically think our relationships and everything we see is kind of driven by bell curve. So that means... The line is actually like this, not like this. And at the beginning of the line is a concentration of people that would have the highest impact. So you think about this weekend and we had 6,000 souls saved. But I can guarantee you that there's a larger concentration of saved souls at Highlands versus other churches. You will think it's average across all churches, but that's not how it works. It's actually concentrated in certain places more than others. And if you look at the Bible, you see this repeated over and over, right? So Jesus tells the parable of the bags of gold. And the master was living, and he gave one ten, he gave one five, he gave one one. The one that had ten turned it to twenty, the one that had five turned it to ten. And many Christians kind of struggle with this, because Jesus said to whom much is given. <laughs> like in the book of Matthew 13, I believe it talks about those who have a lot more will be given to them, and those who do not have the little they have will be taken. It's not because God is a wicked God. It's because God knows that human relationships are power law relationships. So, but if you want to be an inflection point creator, an accelerator, that means you have to be able to create people that are nines and tens that can have significant impact. And God is preparing you for that because you can't give what you don't have. So when you're here, you have to think, what is God preparing me for so I can really have significant impact? You know, there is somebody in my life that was a huge inflection point for me. His name is Pastor Sam. He has no clue where I am today. He doesn't know what I'm doing in my life. He's a very successful minister. He's in Nigeria. But... When I was 16, he came into my life because my parents invited him to come talk to us. And he actually transitioned my life as a Christian from a life that was based on the fear of hell and whatever else that was actually not really working anymore to a life that was more purpose-driven so that God can maximize my potential to have an impact on other people. Sam became the beginning, Pastor Sam became the beginning of my journey into learning my relationship with him led to me reading a book a week for probably the next 20 years of my life. Um, but he didn't know that, but it actually created an inflection point. And that's this room. That's the power you guys have. That's what God is entrusting you to. 
So you have to take it seriously, and you have to <coughs> learn what you need to learn and put yourself in the place you need to put yourself for those things to happen. Uh, but it's very important for you to not be the hero in the story of your journey, okay? The hero in your story needs to be relationships and habits. That's the secret, okay? Because you don't get to where you need to go without being in the right relationship and forming the right habits. It is not genius that makes people nine or ten. It is actually relationships and habits that makes people nine and ten, okay? Um, and finally, don't limit yourself by limiting your skill set or mindset. I can guarantee you, I see this in business all the time, you cannot outgrow your level of skill or your mindset. So as, a, as your leaders, they continue to learn, they continue to get better. Can you imagine if Pastor Chris said, you know what, I don't need to read the Bible anymore. I've read the thing. I've probably read it 500 times. From now on, I'm going to just, I got all the skills I need. This is what will happen. So for you, you have to find ways to accelerate the skills, the skills of effective communication, of, of not just looking, but seeing, okay? The ability to absorb knowledge and interpret it properly and lean on the Spirit of God to help you get there. So you can't limit your skill set, but you also can't limit your mindset. Because if you limit your mindset as to what's possible for you, you will find a way to sabotage whatever God is trying to do in your life. We are not designed to do things that our mind cannot handle because we'll go crazy. Okay? So what you do without knowing is you just sabotage yourself. So you also can't limit your skill set or your mindset. And if you can do those things, if you can put yourself in the right place, leaning on God to guide you, and acquire the kind of knowledge you need to be wise and to understand that the kingdom of God and human relationship as God has designed it is a power law relationship where your job is to really prepare yourself to create the nines and tens of the world that are going to go out there and have significant impact. And that the way for you to get there is by being in the right relationships, forming the right habits, and never limiting your skill set or your mindset. You will be able to do wonderful things. Okay, and it's possible for anybody. If I can do it, anybody can do it. And that's really the message I have for this group today. And uh, with that, I'm going to kind of move us to Q&A and see if you guys have any questions. Don't make them too difficult. Uh, <laughs> No questions. Good morning, Mr. Otolano. My name is Lorian, and I am hey, a Morgan. Highlands College student here in my fourth semester. And I know that for a lot of us, we're either going into summer break or just life after HC, whether that's a job or an internship. And you talked about consistently learning. And to me, I heard being a lifelong learner. So how, as we step into this next season, how can we be lifelong learners? How do you become lifelong learners? So there's one advantage that we have as Christians and we don't really think about, and the, the foundation of wisdom is in the Bible. So that's where the learning starts from, right? God's wisdom, which starts from there. And then the other place you learn from is books. There is, so if you think about, this is going to sound nasty, but just bear with me. Since I have small children, I, I, maybe that's why I have this example in my head. When you're feeding a child uh, at the early age, you don't give them the thing to eat, right? You kind of mush it, and then you put it in their mouth. You take the rice, you smash it, you put it in their mouth. But they still get all the nutrients. That's what books are. So somebody has kind of gone through the experience, um, and then they smash it and give it to you, and you get all the benefit. Uh, so you can't ignore that in your life, right? And then you have relationships. If you always find yourself the smartest person in the place that you're at, it's a problem. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, whether that's in an organization or among 
you may be smarter on one thing than everybody, but you can't always be the smartest person in the room. Otherwise, you're picking the wrong room all the time. <laughs> okay, so, so, uh, so th there is this research on, oh, oh man, this has come to my mind, and my first child is in the room, but I hope she gets the right lesson from this. There's this research on, on first children. It's not always true, but it's commonly true on w why the first siblings tend to you know, do more, sometimes even have higher IQ than the others. <laughs> but it is, actually, it is actually only true in a particular case. It's only true in a particular case. When that first child learns and teaches the others. So the reason why it is common for the first child to be that way is because they learn so they can teach, and by teaching, they actually become really good. So it's actually not generally true for first childs who do not treat the others well <laughs> <laughs> or see their role as a learner that teaches. But, but that, that's what happens when, when you actually learn because you want to impact others. Yeah. So you learn to impact others. Yeah. Right here. Hi, Mr. Oftolana. My name is Catherine Ochoa. You all keep calling me Mr. Lana. It's so weird to hear, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Catherine Ochoa, and I'm a freshman in the worship ministry major. And my question is actually on behalf of my sister, who's younger than me, so that's kind of funny. But she's currently getting her MBA at the University of Alabama, and she wants to go into government contracting. So what advice do you have for her in the business world to keep her faith remain humble, and to just prevent burnout from a predominantly secular world? Yeah, um, that's always hard because we're not of this world, and this world has certain ways it works. But the thing I'm, I'm just going to say is that the laws and the principles and the frameworks work even in the secular world. They actually are just as effective. The thing they don't have that we have is the Spirit of God that's in us, right? So... She shouldn't be afraid of failure, the same principles. She should find the right place with the right people and put herself in the right zone of opportunity. Yeah. She should learn the things she needs to know to make wise decisions, both as an individual and as an employee and whatever else she is. Uh, so it's the same principles no matter where you really kind of find yourself. Don't be afraid of failure. Make the right decision because you have the right information set. Um, don't always be the smartest person in the room. So build the right relationships with the right habits. It's really just the same thing. Now, it's easy for me to say, but these things take time, and you have to practice and continue to pick yourself back up when you fall short. So that, that would really be my advice to her. And to remember that colleges are just places that try to give you a framework for learning, but the learning, the journey still begins with you and being a fertile ground for the things that need to happen. And to put God first, like that's really. Yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, my name is Mason Albivi, and yeah. I. Yeah. <laughs> why, why, is, why, why is Mason so popular? <laughs> <laughs> but I was just curious, sir. I, I was just curious, what types of limitations did you find that you had to overcome in order to expand your sound of opportunities? Good question. Good question. Limitations. Yeah. So many, like, I don't know where to start. Um, I, I told you some, I'd never been in the industry. I was trying to build a large company in. I was in a city that's not really the prime place for you to build technology startups, especially if you want to build a large one. I did not have the money to do what I was trying to do. Uh, so lots of limitations. But the thing is, the limitations, they matter, but they don't. As in, so you, 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 you can't just ignore them and say there are no limitations because you're lying to yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> but the, the strengths are actually more important than the weaknesses. And that's what you have to always remind yourself of, is the strengths that God has given you are actually way more important in determining your ability to accomplish God's mission for your life. Wow than whatever weaknesses you actually have. Because when God gave you that mission, he knew you had the weaknesses too, right? Yeah, yeah. 
so, so um, be, recognize the limitations, whatever they are, yeah. but double down on the strengths that God has given wow. you. Wow, that's good. And that's, that's, that's really it, because think about it, like they teach you when you're riding a bicycle, the bike goes where you're looking. Wow. So if your eye is always on the limitation, you're just going to keep hitting that roadblock all the time. That's good. So, yeah. Good morning, Mr. Otolani. Sorry, my name is... He's like, I am asking my question. I don't care what you say. <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, I'm Connor. I'm a freshman here in the pastoral yes, practicum. Oh! And I have a question. So, obviously, you have this big, very successful company. So, how did you, while you have many tasks focusing on the job, continue to stay focused on the bigger mission at hand for yourself? Um, if, if I rephrase the question, your question is, I have this big company. How did I continue to focus on the mission for myself? Instead of getting caught up in the job. Instead of getting caught up in the job. So... The journey starts with you saying a lot of yeses to expand your zone of opportunity, but your success is going to be determined by the amount of no's you can say. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the trick. You say yes for the right things in the right environment. A lot of yeses open you up, you fail, you succeed, you find the mission for you. And then when you find it, you say no to almost everything else. <laughs> And that's where people get in trouble. They keep saying yes when it's now time to almost always be no. So that means your team, the people around you, know what's most important, right? And they understand when you say no. And you see this, people struggle with this a lot. For example, I'm pretty sure a lot of our pastors at Highlands have to say no to a lot of things. A lot of people don't want to talk, a lot of people don't want them to come talk somewhere, like Pastor Chris probably gets requests nonstop. If he says yes to all of it, he's going to be totally ineffective, right? So he has to create the things that are most important. For me, it's God, family, building people and things. That's what I've been called to do. And do it in a particular way. So everything else should almost always get a no, right? Things like this get a yes because I'm coming to help build people, which is part of what I've been called to do, right? And then the things that other people want me to do, and sometimes you have to train yourself because you're used to saying yes a lot and your whole life as a child and everything else and as a young adult has been things you can't say no to. Your life was designed for you to just say yes to these things that are there. And then you get to a certain point, you find your life's work and life's mission and now you have to turn the switch to mostly no's. That's how you stay focused and that's how you get to what you need to get to. So does that make sense? Oh, uh, I'll let, uh, was she good? You, you can ask your question. Were you going to ask a question? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Hi, Mr. Tulani. My name's Annalise. I'm a freshman in the global ministry major. Um, you mentioned... Oh, man, her questions are written down. This is, I'm, I'm in trouble. <laughs> you mentioned being a fertile ground for good seeds, and I was just curious what that looked like for you practically, and also what that could look like for us and how we could grow in that and be a fertile ground. Yeah. So... It is very hard for the human mind to comprehend uh, exponential growth, right? But that's the story there. So some fell, um, they produced hundreds of seeds. Some fell, they produced 50. But the exponential growth doesn't happen at once. It actually starts with learning putting yourself in the right place. See, I'm just repeating myself over and over because it's actually the secret to all of this. And then, before you know what's happening, it's this way, right? 
and the seeds are bearing a ton of fruit, and they're sprouting out of the ground, and everybody thinks it's overnight, but it's not. So for me, I believe my journey started when I was 16, and I rededicated my life to God, and I rededicated my life to learning and wisdom, and it compounds and compounds and compounds so that you get to that tipping point, and then great things happen pretty quickly, and people think, oh, it happened very fast. You just do the work and let God, you just have to remember, if you do your part, again, the mission is way bigger than you, but the journey starts with you. And if you do your part, right, the God who manages the heavens and the earth will not mismanage your own tiny little life. <laughs> so, you just have to remember that. You do the work and know that he's God of everything. My life is not a lot for him to manage. He's got it, right? So, so that, that's, that's really it. You just focus on doing the things that you need to do and learning the things you need to learn, putting yourself in the right place, and other things work out. All right. Y'all help me thank Shagan Otulano. <laughs>